So let's start the second session. The first speaker is Professor James Liu, University of Michigan, and he is going to tell us about holographic breeze functions in non-relativistic ABS theory. Okay, thank you. Uh, I wanted to talk about uh, some work I've been doing. Uh, I've been doing in collaboration. Uh, with uh, my student uh, Gino Noro and uh, our postdocs in the uh, Heater. And so we've been thinking a little bit about uh, Lipschitz holography, non relativistic uh, ADS-CFT, sort of kind of this matter type applications. There's also uh, a colleague of mine, Kai Sung, who is an actual honest kind of matter theorist who's been able to help us with some of the field theory kind of matter side of things. Uh, some of this is familiar work uh, or familiar. Stuff, but I thought uh, I wanted to highlight some, or possibly you know, one interesting feature of the holographic Green's function you get in these Lipschitz calculations that I feel has not really been emphasized uh, too much so far. Uh, but before telling you about the sort of non-relativistic case, let me just remind you how we use ads -CFT to calculate two-point functions or boundary sort of um, Green's function. And so this is considered the simplest case of a, a scalar field dual to a scalar operator on the CFT side. And the bulk will break down basically, a, let's just say, a free uh, spin zero field. And we're going to do this in the Poincare patch of ADS, which, as you've seen, can be written in this sort of fashion. So to use the ADS CFT dictionary, we basically want to solve for the classical configuration of the scalar with the appropriate conditions at the boundary. And so the first thing we can do is to just solve the scalar field, basically the scalar field equation using this metric over here. And when you do that, uh, this is a familiar exercise. I didn't write down the details. You find out, well, this is translationally invariant in the time and x direction. So we might as well go into momentum space. And so the bulk scalar over here, function that's enough, uh, can be written in terms of a radial solution radio solution is a familiar Bessel function solution, which has uh, it's a second order equation, so we can expand it in various ways. I can expand it in j nu and y nu, or I can expand it in terms of Hankel functions as well. So, I mean, it's uh, it dropped off a little bit somewhere. I can just talk loud without the microphone. <laughs> So anyway, once you have the solution, uh, you impose the, uh, or the uh, standard boundary conditions, and we're going to do sort of real-time correlators to get the uh, so-called retarded Green's function. And we can, um, maybe I'll try and adopt my yeah. I don't know, maybe it's the way I'm talking. Anyway, in sort of this real-time prescription, what we do is this is in a uh, Lorentzian signature, and so the scalar field equation, those special functions can actually oscillate. And what you want to do is impose infalling boundary conditions at the ADS horizon that can bring it into the form of the Hinkle function. Once you've imposed infalling boundary conditions at the horizon, then you have uh, then your boundary behavior is fixed. And the boundary behavior has uh, sort of a non-normalizable mode and a normalizable mode. And you can think about the non-normalizable mode as sort of a source term and the normalizable mode as sort of a response to that source. So in the standard sort of language of the Green's function, when you sort of turn a crank and do the calculation, you can extract the boundary holographic Green's function as sort of a normalizable mode over this non-normalizable mode, D over A. Now, of course, in a conformal theory, we can classify operators in terms of the temporal dimension. So all the scaling and everything is just built in to this problem. If you don't get the right scaling, you can make a mistake. So as I said, imposing infalling boundary conditions, we do this Hankel function, basically a traveling wave. And then once you've done that, the metric I wrote over here, I should have mentioned, is R goes to zero for the boundary. And so the boundary, you take the limit as R goes to zero and zero. Okay. 
of the extractive boundary behavior at r goes to zero. Can you find out if you have any Carter-Green's function like this? No. Uh, there are certain uh, coefficients or constants, which is not too important. The main feature is I've uh, sort of Fourier transformed, and so key squared over here is the uh, forward momentum or the uh, lower dimension of um, momentum uh, key squared of the conformal field, field theory. And so, as appropriate for a conformal or a scale invariant theory, the great function has no scales, it's just q squared to some power. So the Green's function is just q squared to the power of u, uh, up to some possibly complex coefficient. Now this was done in momentum space. If you go back to position space, it gives you just the very familiar CFT correlators, the correlation function between operators at position x and position y. Only it depends on the separation, x minus y. And it falls off as a power law, because there's no scales involved, power law with the appropriate conformal dimension. Another way to say this is although you build up this machinery of ADS CFT to uh, calculate boundary correlation functions, you would have known the answer just from conformal matrix. This is very kinematic. There's no dynamics in saying the Green's function falls off as the appropriate uh, power law given the conformal dimension of your operators. So you really need to go to high point functions or Wilson loops or additional sort of non local uh, observables to get information out of ADS CFT. So with this in mind, I want to say, I want to consider what happens if I want to do some non-relativistic scaling. So. All right, so, all right, let me try it this way. So now let me consider sort of the non-relativistic case. Now what I mean by non-relativistic is I want a boundary theory that has non-relativistic scaling. The bulk theory, of course, I still will describe in a relativistic manner. And so the scaling we have in mind, which might be sort of related to a quantum critical point or something like that, is I'm going to split off time versus space. And if I scale time by lambda, then space direction scales by lambda to the 1 over z. And the conventional way of thinking about this is I scale x by lambda, and time gets scaled by lambda to the z where z is the critical exponent or the dynamic exponent. Um, it, it's more convenient, I feel, uh, for writing out the metric to impose the scaling of this nature. And what you do, of course, is to have a bulk description of the scale variant theory over here. You add an r direction, you add a bulk direction, and if it, say r goes to lambda r, you can end up writing a metric kind of like that. So this is sometimes referred to as the Lipschitz metric. The possibly more conventional way of writing the Lipschitz metric is to single out the time direction as scaling as 1 over r to the 2z. Um, but by a transformation, you can put the scaling in the x direction instead. Anyway, if you take this for granted as a sort of Lipschitz background for doing ads -CFT, you can just calculate a correlation function using a standard technique. You can get a scalar Green's function. You solve the scalar equation with this metric. You impose then falling boundary conditions. You look at the boundary, look for normalizable and non-normalizable modes, and just see what you get. The first thing, of course, is with this kind of background, the, scalar, the bulk scalar equation is a little bit different, but it's not very hard to work out. You can consider, as I said, z is the critical exponent. If I set z equals 1, then space and time scale the same way. And in fact, you have a hidden uh, sort of Poincaré symmetry you know, of time and x inside here for z equals 1. If I had z equals 1, then this r, or factor of r over here disappears. And then you can see the uh, grand squared minus dt squared forms the four-dimensional D'Alembertian or the relativistic uh, wave operator over here. Uh, when time is different, then it's split off in a different manner like that. So solutions to this equation over here are a little bit more complicated. You can still Fourier transform x and time directions into plane waves. Because although you've lost the 
boost symmetry between pi and x, the um, translation symmetries are still there. And so all you have is a dis an R factor in front of k over here. You can imagine, if I tell you what z is, like z equals 1, this disappears, that becomes a relativistic case. If I said z equals 2, then I get a different power over here, something like 1 over r. If it had a non integer value z, then it becomes a little bit more obnoxious as a differential equation. Anyway, this is a second order ODE. So we all have different techniques of solving or at least understanding the properties of the second order equation. One thing you can do is you can write it in the form of an uh, effective Schrodinger equation, which means I get rid of the first derivative term. And the reason you could do this, or the reason that this could be useful, is to build up some intuition you've had just from ordinary quantum mechanics. I mean, you don't need to do this. It's just sort of a uh, way to help you some of your intuition. To so get rid of the first derivative term by doing a transformation into something like a Schrodinger field psi over here with a uh, potential. And potential is very interesting. It has this m squared over r squared term gets modified a little bit to what I call nu squared minus a quarter over r squared. This is some effective um, quantity over here, which is related to the scaling dimension. I put omega squared as an energy-like term on the right-hand side of the Schrodinger equation. What we're left with here is the spatial momentum factor with this funny power bar uh, over here. So, you remember how you do quantum mechanics. This is a one-dimensional Schrodinger equation. You can think about it as a one-dimensional potential energy problem. And one of the first things you can do is plot the potential energy, see what it looks like, and see what the wave functions should behave like. So potential is a sum of two terms, a one over r squared term, which is steep at r equals zero. It's sort of a dashed blue line over here. And one over r with some other power here. I'm assuming the critical exponent z is bigger than one, in which case this is a power law, the purple line over here, which is shallower than the one over r squared line. For example, for z equals two, which I'll talk about shortly, this is a one over r type behavior. So potential falls off. This is not a bound state problem. But the other thing you can see is this is a sum of two power laws. And there's a bit of a transition region such that for very small r, the one over r squared term dominates. And for large r, this one over r to the other fr fraction over here dominates. The, once you look at a potential like that, you might think, well, there's no bound state. But also, there's a potential barrier. This runs off to infinity. So the wave function might go over here, might reflect off of here or something. But another way to think about it is this is sort of a classically forbidden region if the energy is not sufficiently high because this goes off to infinity. And this is a classically allowed region over here. So to ignore normalizability of wave functions and other things you normally do in quantum mechanics, you can imagine I have a traveling wave, uh, we'll have a wave solution, an oscillating solution over here, and have an exponential solution over here under a tunneling type barrier. However, one thing that's a little bit interesting is you say tunneling is usually an exponential suppression or exponential uh, you know, tunneling factor. But this one over r squared potential, in some sense, is too steep to tunnel through, which means if I actually try to do a calculation, let me assume. I want to solve the Schrodinger equation for very small r. Let me just drop this term over here. The Schrodinger equation looks like that. This is homogeneous in r. You can find an exact solution to this. And what I said approximately zero because I dropped this term over here. I've also dropped the energy term. Um, but other than this over here, if I took this as a differential equation to solve, this is an exact solution, this power law behavior over here. So in that sense, this potential, one of our squares is too steep to have an exponential factor, it's a power law to a solution. But this is exactly what you want in the ADS-CFT language. You want the wave function uh, or the scalar solution to approach the boundary with a non-normalizable mode and a normalizable mode with the power law scaling given by the uh, 
uh, conform or rather the saving dimension of the uh, dual operator. So once I see the boundary behavior like that, I know how to extract the boundary drinks function coefficient of the normalizable mode over that of the non-normalizable mode. Now because we've split off time and space, we have omega and k, we have sort of the uh, energy and the momentum, which can take on uh, different values. So let me just uh, highlight sort of the crossover region over here. Uh, just by setting the one of our square term equal to this term over here, you find out there's a crossover uh, uh, radius over here, or radial direction, related to uh, space momentum k and the critical exponent z. I just, just treat nu as a constant, basically, fixing some scaling dimension of your operator. And then at this crossover region over here, the energy, or the potential energy, is written as something like that. So now if I solve the Schrodinger equation, I usually draw an energy over here, and I'm going to solve h psi equals e times psi with the particular energy. The energy up here will have different behavior than energy down here. If energy up here basically only sees the one of our square potential, energy down here will see the uh, less steep potential over here. So let me just consider those two cases. If the frequency or the energy is higher than this sort of uh, crossover energy over here, then I can more or less approximate the potential by just ignoring this term over here. This is a high frequency limit. If I ignore the tail of the potential over here, all I'm doing is I'm doing quantum mechanical scattering type problem with the one over R squared potential. I'm not looking for normalizable wave functions. I'm looking for wave functions that have a traveling wave falling into the EDS horizon or falling into the Lipschitz horizon. If I have a traveling wave falling into the horizon over here, then the solution over here is not guaranteed to be normalizable unless you're doing, unless you're at just some right sort of uh, quantized values of energy, which doesn't happen for the positive energies over here. Um, but nevertheless, you get normalizable and non-normalizable modes. That gives you a Green's function, which is written down over here. This is basically the same, we'll up to some uh, omega squared instead of q squared. This is the same as the relativistic Green's function. Of course, this is omega. This is not omega squared minus k squared because I'm in the high frequency limit where I'm just completely ignoring k, basically. The only thing that I have left is omega. But other than that, this is basically the relativistic answer for Green's function. So at high energies or high frequencies, you're left with just a scale invariant type of Green's function like that. You have more or less no other choice in the problem to get something like that. So this is sort of featureless or universal behavior of the holographic Green's function. The opposite of that is you go to the lower energy limit over here. And there's a classically uh, classical turning point over here. You have an oscillating region over here. And then you have a long sort of tunneling region over here. As I said, the one of our square potential is too, too steep to tunnel through. So that gives you power law behavior. However, the potential shallows out over here. So this region over here, this part of the potential over here, really has exponential suppression in terms of a tunneling type of amplitude. So you can imagine the behavior of the holographic Green's function would be substantially different whether you're up here or down here. And the answer is that does show that shows up. Unfortunately, for arbitrary z, it's a little bit hard to write down a nice sort of closed form solution of what goes on over here. There's a couple of approaches. One is to investigate the behavior. If I put in z equals 2, this is a 1 over r squared term. You can actually write down exact solutions over here. The other possibility is you can do like something. Once I put in a Schrodinger equation form, you can do something like a WKB approximation. And anyone who's done sort of tunneling problems like usually will think WKB gives you uh, some approximation to the tunneling amplitude. Well, let me just look at z equals 2 case first. Takashi Lewin-Mulligan sort of proposed this idea of non-relativistic 
holography and uh, in their original work they calculated the relativistic the holographic Green's function and basically this is the answer that they have if I go to ratio gamma functions over here this minus four omega squared to some uh, scaling power nu over here it looks very standard this is sort of behavior you might expect in a scale invariant theory now this is Lipschitz scaling which is equals two so the scaling quantity over here is k squared over two omega. Think about it as like p squared over two uh, energy equals p squared over two m or something like that. Um, and so this is still uh, obeys the scale invariance of the theory. And then I have a ratio of a gamma function over here. So, again, so now given this exact analytic answer over here, you can study its asymptotic limits. So for High frequencies, that means omega goes to infinity. These terms basically go to zero. And these are just ratios of gamma functions, which combined with these guys over here can be rewritten just using some simple identities. And this gives you sort of the high energy behavior, which is just a standard scaling behavior. Let me just mention this minus sign over here. If I think about the uh, scaling dimension related to nu over here, this is not exactly scaling dimension, but it's related to scaling dimension. Um, if I think about nu as potentially a you know, non-integer dimension over here, then this minus sign to the nu, there's a uh, branch cut, and this can actually give you a complex behavior, e to the i pi nu, basically. So the Green's function over here could be complex. I started with a real differential equation. I end up with a complex solution. But what happened is because I've imposed boundary conditions, of a traveling wave, which sort of builds up sort of a complex sort of uh, amplitude. So anytime you have a traveling wave fall into the horizon, it's natural that uh, your solution in the binary condition will give you some complex numbers over here. And that gives you, that's actually very good for a, a real-time Green's function, because the imaginary part of the Green's function is related to the spectral density in the theory. I'll, I'll get back to that in just a moment. The other thing is for small omega over here, then the terms over here get large, and I'm doing gamma, ratios of gamma functions of large imaginary, or large complex, but mostly large imaginary arguments over here. You can do a Stirling approximation. You have an essential singularity, which makes things a little bit more complicated, and you get something like that. The first part here is if omega is going to zero, then the only sort of quantity left is k, and in scale invariant theory, the best you can do is scale k to some scaling dimension. Since k scales, um, well, like k squared over omega, if k scales uh, twice as much as omega, you have omega to the two new scaling over here, corresponding to k to the four new scaling over there. An interesting thing about this is you have the leading order term over here, and it picks up a exponentially, exponentially suppressed term over here, a non-analytic term, as a e to the minus one over omega behavior over here. And this is directly due to the tunneling under the uh, potential. If you want the imaginary part of the Green's function over here, the first term is real, the imaginary part comes from the imaginary part of this complex length limit over here. So this has an exponentially suppressed but non-zero imaginary component. So let me just give you uh, some pictures. As I said, uh, you can do this in general for other z's if you use a WKB approximation. You have to be a little bit careful about what WKB can or cannot do for you. And so it turns out that the real part is hard to get. But the imaginary part of the Green's function, you can verify, uh, is under control in the WKB approximation. Actually, the imaginary part of the Green's function is not bad, because I already just mentioned in words that that's basically what sometimes called the spectral function, and it's related to the density of states of the excitation of the spectrum. So if you look at a matrix part of the Green's function, it tells you a little bit about the density of states or accessible states in your model. And so I won't go through the details, but to say WKB gives you these sort of phase type integrals, which in the tunneling region turns out to be is a real integral. And you find out the matrix part of the return Green's function is related to this tunneling up to e to the minus two s, where s is WKB integral like that. 
So if you actually do the calculation, WKB is an approximation. On top of that, the WKB integral for arbitrary z is not something that can be done analytically. So you make a second approximation. If you go into the low frequency limit, you can approximate the integral and get an answer like that. This is just to confirm the exponential suppression. And this is, as omega goes to zero, you get this analytic behavior, e to the minus one over omega, and raise to some power, basically. Everything else here are constant. So you have exponentially suppressed but non-zero spectral weight in the low frequency limit. It turns out you have an essential singularity at omega equals zero. Let me give you a couple of pictures. If I wanted to look at the Green's function, or this uh, spectral function over here, let me just focus on this picture here. Now this is the z equals one or the relativistic case. For fixed k, and these are just numbers we picked for the plots, there is no spectral weight for small omega over here. But for a large enough omega, then you develop an imaginary part of the Green's function. Normally you think about, if you had a discrete quasi-particle quasi -particle spectrum, these, the spectral function would be delta functions or smeared out delta functions like that, plus a continuum, and this is a continuum sort of thing. And it's a, a unusual features of a conformal theory that it goes kind of like that. Nevertheless, if I looked at the spectral function in the omega versus k plane over here, uh, I have non-zero spectral weight for time-like uh, forward momentum, and so I have non-zero spectral weight inside the light cone, basically here, and nothing outside the light cone. In terms of analytic properties, you got branch cuts kind of like that. And anyone who studied quantum field theory, this picture is not such, it's a pretty standard picture. However, if we do that for the non-relativistic case, again, z equals two, just for simplicity, you find out that the spectral function is non-zero all the way to zero frequency, except it's exponentially suppressed over here. And you see the standard quadratic dispersion relation showing up over here as well. Uh, I'm afraid I'm basically out of time. So let me just highlight, uh, normally for causality, you don't want any unphysical poles, and you don't want any poles in the upper half plane. We find unphysical poles in the second sheet of the uh, uh, complex omega plane over here, and they accumulate at omega equals zero, which is sort of the feature of the uh, essential singularity behavior. So this, of course, is special. It appears e equals two, this is scaling, but this is supposed to give some hint that you have an essential singularity or some uh, non-analytic behavior in the uh, low frequency limit of the uh, non-relativistic Green's function. Um, in light of the time, let me not say too much about this, but because it's a scalar variant theory, we know that Green's function can be written in terms of a scalar variant quantity, omega over k to the z. There's only, in the ADS case or the relativistic case, the kinematics completely determines the Green's function, in the non-relativistic case, there's an arbitrary curly G function over here with certain properties, but properties that don't always have, aren't obviously fixed. And so we realized that in order to get different Green's functions, corresponding to different finesse matter models, you actually have to introduce higher derivatives in the bulk. And to do so, you can model that by modification of the Schrodinger potential, which is some arbitrary function over here related to higher derivative terms. And when you're looking more generally, you find out that the holographic Green's function remains, also has an exponentially suppressed region. We lose perturbative control on the side over here, so we're not exactly what happens when omega strictly goes to zero, but for the small frequency limit, you find the same exponential suppression as you do in the case without higher derivatives. So, we're trying to make a claim that there are some universal properties in the low frequency limit, which, so that the spectral function remains suppressed in exponential or in non analytic sort of manner uh, in the low frequency regime over here. So I think I'll just end with that, um, with just a few comments that you can read on your own. Thank you.